Hi, it's your scary fairy godmother. Before we venture into the fairy world together, I'd like to take a moment to thank all my supporters on Patreon and all those who have joined the channel or made a one-off donation. Your support helps enormously and will ultimately help me to make more and better videos more often. If you like this content and would like to become a monthly supporter, head over to my Patreon page at patreon.com slash scaryfairygodmother or become an official channel member by clicking the join button under this video for only 99 cents. Links for support options can be found in the description. Thank you so much. Now, follow me into the fairy world. He watched the wheeling eddies boil, till from their foam his dazzled eyes beheld the river demon rise. The river demon, referred to there by Sir Walter Scott in his epic poem Lady of the Lake, is of course the Kelpie. Famous across Scotland and indeed the world, this malevolent water fairy is one of the drowners, a type of fairy known for their love of dragging human victims underwater and never letting go. But unlike most drowners, the Kelpie tends to appear in a form not normally associated with the water, a horse, a quite beautiful horse to be exact, with a mane that shimmers like moonlight. The Kelpie appears in this form, a pale horse, white or gray, to lost or weary travelers. It stands by the water or canters lightly out of a newly risen mist, saddled and bridled, drawing to it hapless humans foolish enough to reach out and touch it. For once you lay a hand on a kelpie, or worse, climb onto its back, you'll find yourself unable to dismount or let go as the kelpie races towards the water at an incredible speed and then dives in. And once the kelpie hits the water, your chances of survival are none. There's not a single known story of anyone anywhere who has touched the water attached to a kelpie and live to tell the tale. There are, however, tales of rare souls who have survived by separating themselves from a kelpie before it manages to plunge into the deep. Unfortunately, such survival comes at a terrible price. The only way to escape a kelpie once you have touched one is to sever your own limb. There is one famous story of a child who survived by slicing off his own finger after touching a kelpie's nose and becoming stuck there. Sadly, his friends who had climbed onto the kelpie's back were not so lucky. Skilled shapeshifters, kelpies also sometimes appear as handsome men or beautiful women, whatever form that might best serve as a lure for the victim they have targeted. The original Loch Ness monsters, kelpies are in a sense fishermen in reverse. They use themselves as sparkling lures to snare human fish and pull them down into their world under the water. No one knows what the Kelpie does to its human victims after dragging them below. It may be that it views humans as a food source and consumes them as casually as we consume fish. Or it might harbor some deep hatred for humanity and kill for pleasure or revenge. The possibilities are not pleasant. But, Though Kelpies present a mortal danger to humans who should avoid them at all costs, there are tales of mad souls who have purposely sought out a Kelpie and gained mastery over it. The Kelpie's biggest weakness is its bridle. If you can steal a Kelpie's bridle and keep it hidden, it will have no choice but to serve you and do anything you say. And because Kelpies possess remarkable powers like superhuman strength and speed, and the ability to shapeshift, having a kelpie at your beck and call might come in handy. But enslaving a kelpie is dangerous and foolish. After a short while, you may find yourself more enslaved to that bridle, to keeping it hidden and safe, than the kelpie is to you. For the kelpie does not sleep, and will use every minute of every hour of every day to plot against you and search for its lost bridle. If the Kelpie does manage to get free, 
it'll wipe you and your entire family line off the face of the earth. That means if you steal a Kelpie's bridal, you'll have to pass this burden, this curse, down to your descendants and make sure they all understand the importance of protecting it from the Kelpie, who they must now both command and fear for the rest of their lives. But for most of us, an arrangement like that would never be worth the cost. So if you ever see a horse that shimmers like the moon, or in a naturally beautiful man or woman by the water, hair dripping wet. Do yourself a favor, turn around and run. The foxes, or kitsune of Japan, are to all appearances ordinary wild animals, roaming the land, hunting for food, fighting for survival. But in truth, they are much more than that. In Japan, foxes have the ability to outlive the common foxes of other parts of the world by many hundreds or even thousands of years, and in so doing, take on supernatural powers. Similar to the Huli Jing of China and the Gumiho of Korea, the Kitsune are believed to gain wisdom and supernatural skill with age, the oldest of them becoming so powerful that they are said to transcend their earthly existence and ascend to a higher realm. Kitsune are a highly intelligent species, and yet their thinking, their motivations, their way of life remains foreign and mysterious to human beings who only occasionally get a glimpse into the Kitsune's world. That world appears to us as wholly magical. Capable of great speed and even flight, Kitsune roam the wild places of Japan with strange glowing balls of light known as foxfire clutched between their teeth or dangling from their tails like paper lanterns. It is said that these glowing lights, or star balls, hold a portion of the kitsune's magical powers, or else that they contain a kitsune's very soul. There is no way to know for certain one way or another, though in some stories, when a human got hold of one of these glowing balls, a kitsune would offer a boon in exchange for its safe return, so it's clear these objects are precious to them in some way. Human encounters with powerful kitsune are rare, though such stories do exist and continue to be told, passed down through the generations. Like humans, kitsune can either be good or evil, benevolent or malicious, and all things in between. The more benevolent of the kitsune are associated with the Shinto deity, Inari, and are said to act as messengers between humanity and the divine, offering humans who encounter them health, wealth, and good luck. Other, more wicked foxes, engage in mischievous behavior, pranking, tricking, or manipulating humans for their own pleasure or benefit. These foxes are known as nogetsune, or wild foxes, and are particularly notorious for transforming into humans, usually beautiful young women, in order to lead unsuspecting victims astray. Some nogetsune have even been known to possess human beings, much like a ghost or a demon might, seeping into the skin under the fingernails and taking over. Victims of fox spirit possession, or kitsunetsuke, will start to behave in all sorts of unusual ways. Their speech patterns may change, they may speak slower or faster than usual, or in a more formal or old-fashioned way, or have difficulty pronouncing certain words. And they may be able to speak languages they previously could not speak, a telltale sign of kitsune possession is increased hunger, particularly a craving for fried tofu, which is a favorite of the kitsune. The facial structure of a possessed victim may also shift, causing them to take on a more vulpine appearance, with sharper teeth and higher features. To hide these changes, they may avoid direct lighting and keep more often to the shadows. Once in possession of a human, a kitsune can control its victim like a puppet. In some stories, kitsune were said to have possessed entire families, either for revenge or amusement. 
Such families experienced short-term benefits such as wealth, increased fertility, and good luck, but in the long run became ostracized by the community who feared the foxes squatting under their skin and, as a result, were led to personal and financial ruin. A full exorcism may be the only way to rid someone of a possessing fox, so it's better to avoid possession in the first place. Stay away from beautiful strangers who appear out of nowhere in wild places, and keep your eyes open for signs of the fox in all your encounters. A swish of a bushy tail under a jacket, a flash of two sharp teeth, a shadow that looks human one minute, an animal the next. For though the world of the Kitsune appears wondrous and intriguing, it is dangerous when it crosses into ours. The sea, its depths, its darkness, its rhythms, remain in many ways a mystery to us, though we float on its surface on land-carved vessels and have done for thousands of years. There is a world beneath the waves, in the deep darkness, few have ever experienced. What undiscovered creatures lurk below, and do they know about us, and perhaps even interact with us, though we know nothing about them? In German lore, the Klabautermann is a water fairy that sometimes haunts the decks of human ships for reasons unknown. Though rarely seen and thought to be invisible, the Klabautermann has in some cases been described as a diminutive creature, about two feet tall, in a red coat and a round hat, carrying a smokeless tobacco pipe. Though others have described a human-sized man, an unknown sailor in a woolen sailor's cap, who appears briefly on deck at night, during a storm, or whenever there is confusion, and then fades into the shadows. A kind of otherworldly stowaway, the Klabouterman is capable of blending in with the crew and going entirely unnoticed on long sea voyages. Sometimes he makes his presence known with the sound of haunting music that shivers over the masts and the sails and reverberates over the deck. For the Klabouterman, like many of the Fae, is a skilled musician. The earliest tales describe him as a helpful or benevolent fairy, thought to guard the ship from illnesses, storms, rocks, icebergs, and other disasters, and is said to hide inside of figureheads of ships when not surreptitiously roaming the decks. For this reason, some sailors believe that in order to ensure a safe and successful voyage, they had to first attract a Klabouterman, inviting one onto their ship and keeping it on board. The ship's figurehead was key to achieving this goal. The more ornate, the more beautiful, the more precise its design, the more likely it was to attract a Klabouterman to dwell inside it. But over time, stories of these seafaring fairies took a more sinister turn. Rumors rose that this fairy's intentions were not as benevolent as initially assumed. Whispers of poltergeist activity aboard ships, of accidents and malfunctions, of mysterious food spoilages or sudden, unexplained enmity between friends. It is suspected that the Klabouterman may have had an invisible hand in all these misfortunes. But what turned the Klabouterman from a friendly helper of sailors at sea to their tormentor, and in some cases, potentially, their murderer? There are many theories, but the most compelling suggests that some sailors, rather than just inviting Klabouterman onto their ships, kidnapped one, locking him away in the prison of the ship's figurehead, there to remain trapped and suffering until the figurehead was destroyed. Driven to madness and thoughts of revenge, the Klabouterman once released made it his mission to punish the sailors who hurt him, and maybe all sailors for all time. And indeed, the Klabouterman will now often only appear to sailors on a doomed ship. For this reason, it's now considered risky to seek out a Klabouterman for help, and best not to add a figurehead to your ship at all. For these lonely fairies should be left alone to wander the seas, 
play their haunting music, and interact with humans only if and when they choose. Beneath the earth, a twisted labyrinth of caves and caverns carved by millions of years of erosion has exposed an underworld of gemstones and stalactites and strange creatures that live in the dark. When the miners and explorers of the past first discovered these deep, magical places, they were likely stunned by the beauty they found there. The sense that these sparkling caverns could almost be rooms in a great underworld palace, or else the hidden pathways, colonnades, and galleries of an only partially discovered city underground. But the beauty found below can be explained by natural phenomenon. What cannot be explained are the fairy experiences often reported by those who venture into the earth. When the miners of Cornwall first dug unnatural burrows in the earth, perhaps disturbing things never meant to be disturbed, they began to report unusual activity. It started with a knocking sound, a gentle tapping on the earthen walls too deliberate to be random, knocks that repeated, that had a music to them or a pattern, knocks that echoed deep in the dark. These knocks, it was decided, were the work of fairies, an unusual type of fairy known as a knocker. Knockers live beneath the earth, under hill, under mountain, under dale, and interact occasionally with human miners or explorers by knocking on cave walls. Though rarely seen, witnesses have described knockers as dwarf-like in appearance, standing around two feet tall with wrinkled skin, dressed like old-fashioned miners, sometimes even carrying a pickaxe or a lantern. Miners and others who spend more time than usual under the earth have come up with all sorts of theories as to why the knockers knock. Some believe these earthbound fairies are benevolent, that they knock to direct miners to rich veins of gold or to warn them of danger like a coming cave-in. Others say the knockers are malevolent, that they knock to cause rather than to warn of cave-ins while still others believe knockers are merely mischievous, that they enjoy playing practical jokes on hapless humans, and their knocking is all part of the fun at our expense. In support of the mischief theory, these fairies also have a tendency to steal or move mining equipment to toss handfuls of dirt at miners, especially those who whistle or swear, which the knockers are said to hate to appear out of nowhere and pull mad faces and then vanish, giggling loudly at the fright they've given their human victim. But it may also be that the knocking of the knockers has little to do with us, that they knock for their own reasons, perhaps as communication, a secret code they use to send messages back and forth, a warning to each other that humans are near and they must pause their ordinary activities. Whatever their motivations, Human miners have learned to treat the knockers with respect, for these small fairies have proven themselves to be quick, intelligent, disproportionately strong, and capable of causing all sorts of damage if crossed. To keep the peace with the knockers, miners will doff their hats and helmets upon entering a mine as a show of respect, and leave offerings of food or drink in the hopes that these underground fairies will let them do their work without interference. On a more dramatic scale, certain mines have been closed altogether because of knocker activity. It is thought that these underground places have been claimed by the knockers, perhaps because they are sacred to them, or else just important areas of trade or travel in the knockers' underground world. Whatever the case, humans would do well to avoid these places, to let the people underground keep their secret cities buried. For uncovering them, could lead to consequences we can't possibly comprehend. The 
The men here, the standing stones, monoliths, megaliths of the prehistoric world, have puzzled scientists and historians for centuries. How were these heavy stones carried, lifted, and mounted by people thousands and thousands of years ago? People who hadn't even invented the wheel? And why did they go to such lengths to erect these stone structures in the first place? There are many theories. One of the most interesting involves the fairy. A specific type of fairy, to be precise, called Corids. Tales of Corids circulated out of Brittany in northwestern France, where thousands of standing stones pepper the countryside. The Corids are said to have brought the stones to Brittany and assembled and arranged them using mysterious fairy methods for even more mysterious fairy reasons. The Corids are an elven species, human-sized and bizarre in appearance. They have been described as lanky and bird-like, with spindly legs, spiky hair, flashing deep-set eyes, and long, pointed noses. Corids protect the stones. This seems to be their raison d'etre. And their frightening appearance may help them achieve that goal. Because of this, some have guessed that their appearance could be a fake, a glamour, a disguise meant to repel. For with the fairies, nothing is ever as it seems. Surfacing mostly at night under the moon, Corids are said to live by day beneath the stones, more specifically under dolmens, which are a type of megalithic tomb. These tombs look like giant tables, several leg-like standing stones topped with a large flat capstone. Beneath the dolmens, snippets of music can occasionally be heard, and laughter and voices. These are thought to be the Korids engaged in some unknown gathering or celebration. When the Korids surface, they are said to dance in great swirling revels round and round the stones. Humans who disturb or become drawn into these dances rarely survive. Mysterious incidents have been reported of human victims found near the stones, dead. Their backs, legs, or ankles broken. These unfortunates are thought to have fallen afoul of the Korids, swept into their whirling dances, perhaps as punishment for having disrespected the stones, and then danced to death. Birds that hunch on megaliths or whirl in the air above are said to be spies of these fairies, keeping an eye on human visitors and reporting any misbehavior to the Korids below. Though it could be that these birds are Korids themselves, shapeshifted into a form humans would not suspect, the better to watch over their dolmens and keep them from harm. Little else is known about the Korids, who are as mysterious as the stones they guard. What is known is that the world's megalithic structures must be respected and protected, for they do not belong to us alone. Thanks for watching. As always, special thanks goes out to all my supporters on Patreon who are helping to keep this content alive. I really appreciate you guys so much and the support you are giving this work. It means the world to me and others who are interested in this topic. If you like this content and would like to support it, please check out my Patreon page. The link is in the description. You can also now join the channel by clicking the join button under this video or on my main channel page for 99 cents which is also hugely helpful for the channel. Um, every little bit helps, helps me create more videos and gives me more time to do so. So please join or uh, head over to my Patreon page. In the meantime, don't forget to comment below, like, share, and subscribe if you're new and hit the bell to receive notifications of new videos. And until next time, this has been a visit from your scary fairy godmother.